us in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite songs by Stevie Wonder when I was growing up is the song Overjoyed. It is actually a story of a guy who was planning his life uh, and dreaming of being together with this woman who didn't want to have anything to do with him. And so the song goes, over time I've been building my castle of love just for two, though you never knew you were my reason. I've gone much too far for you now to say that I've got to throw my castle away. A beautiful song, but sad, because basically she says, not happening, not happening. And so the rest of the song, she tries to convince her by saying, and maybe too, if you would believe. In other words, if you would give it a chance, you too might be overjoyed, over love, over me. And she says, nope, <laughs> wrong guy. <laughs> In the passage that we read, David didn't want to build a castle. He wanted to build a temple. And basically, God says, it's not happening, David. He says in a parallel passage in 1 Corinthians 17.3, But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, it is not, what? You who will build a house for me, build me a house to dwell in. It is not you. Not happening. Nope. Wrong guy. <laughs> it's one thing to hear or read about people's broken dreams. It's another to have your dreams broken, isn't it? Maybe you've always wanted to be a doctor, but your parents couldn't afford to send you to medical school. Or maybe you couldn't pass biochemistry, and so you had to choose a different path. Maybe you wanted to become a businessman, a successful businessman, and you were thinking, you know, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to own my own business. By the time I'm 40, I'm going to have three or four of these businesses turn into a franchise, and by 50, I'll be ready to retire. And you're ready 50 and you still don't own your own business. And not happening. Or maybe you were in love once and you thought that this is her. She's the one that I, I'm going to marry. And eventually she says, nope, wrong guy. What do you do? What do you do when your dreams are broken? And what do you do when God says no to your plans? The background of this passage is David wanting to build a temple for God after he had been crowned king at Hebron. If you remember, in, in chapter 6, all the tribes came and they submitted their allegiance to David, and he was crowned king over all of Israel. And then his first move was to take the Jebusite city, which is now called Jerusalem, to be the capital of all of Israel. As soon as he did that, the Philistines attacked, and he defeated them not once, but twice. And after he had pushed them back, his next act as a king was to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Abinadab's house, to bring it to Jerusalem so that Jerusalem will not only be the capital of Israel, it will be the religious center of the nation's worship. But as he brought the Ark of the Covenant in, and as he was overlooking the tent that housed the ark, perhaps from his balcony, from his magnificent palace, David says, I want to do something for God. It's not right that I, I live in this beautiful palace and that he lives in a tent. I want to build God a house. And basically God says, no. What do you do when God says no to your plans? What do you do when your dreams are broken and you had been planning your life all along and you, you have it all down, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, your 15-year plan, and, and God just tears it up and says, nope, not happening. What do you do when God says no? This passage, we find David uh, giving us an example of what to do when God says no to you. Three things, three significant things happen in, 
in this passage. First of all, you find the proposal of David to build God a house. In verse 1, it says, Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. In other words, David says, it's not right. It's not right that I should live in a place more beautiful than the ark, than the representation of God's presence. Verse 3, and Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Nathan the prophet, the first time he enters the picture in First and Second Samuel says, sounds good to me. Go for it, David. Because what could be wrong in wanting to build God a house? What could be wrong in wanting to build God a temple? Can't be anything wrong with that, can there? But here's the principle. Make sure that what you do is not only for the Lord. Make sure that it is from the Lord. Even great things need to be submitted to God's will. Just because it is a good thing doesn't mean that it is God's will. Whenever you do anything, make sure that it's not only for the Lord, make sure that it is from the Lord, that you consult them. So sure enough, in verse 4, it says, But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. And what did God say? Verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. So I said, David, would you really build me a house? And the implied answer is no. Well, I have not asked you to build me a house. In fact, he says, since David built the tent, I have been dwelling for about 400 years in this tent. And I've been following my people. He wanted a tent so that he could, he could easily be picked up. And when the, when the people move, he could move with the people because he wanted to be with his people. And in verse 7, in all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? And in fact, David, God was saying, I've never asked for a house, and I'm not asking you for one. I didn't command you to build me a house. But still, we need to commend David because he wanted to do more than God commands. How many of you want to do more than God commands? Many of us want to do the very least to, when it comes to God's command. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's just, okay, oh, how, do I really have to give that much? I, really have, I mean, let, let me just go to where I barely make God's command. But David wanted to do more. And so it's, it's commendable. But God says, not the right person, not the right time. It's not that God didn't want a, a temple built, but it wasn't the right time. And so he says in verse 8, now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from, the, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. God reminds David, you want to do something for me? Let me remind you of what I've done for you. I took you from the pastures to the palace. He says in verse 9, and I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. God reminds David, you have been successful. You have been triumphant. You have been victorious over your enemies, not because you're a great warrior, but because I was with you. And then he says, David, guess what? There's more to come. I have not only blessed you in the past, I want to bless you in the future in verse 10. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel. And I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. I will give your land rest. I will give your people rest. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed the judges over my people Israel. Then he says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Then here's the, here's the best part, and that's what we'll talk about the rest of this message. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. David, you want to make me a house? I'm going to make you a house. It's a play on words. When David says, I want to make you a house, I want to build you a temple. I want to build you a building. When God says, I want to make you a house, he's talking about a dynasty. I want to establish your reign forever 
and ever. So here you find David was proposing to build a temple, and God says, nope, not happening. But God gives David a promise, so I will build you a house, and he promises two things. Here's how I will build your house. Here's my promise to you, David. You want to do something for me? Let me do something for you. Two things, two promises. First of all, he says, I want to give you a son who will build the house. I want to give you Solomon. It says in verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He, talking about Solomon, shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of man, with the stripes of the sons of man. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. So he says, David, I'll make two promises. One, instead of you building the house, I'm going to give you a son who will be the one to build the house. And unlike Solomon, uh, unlike Saul, whose kingdom was ripped away from him, he says, Solomon will continue to reign until he dies. But then here's a greater promise. Here's how God will establish David's house forever. It says in verse 16, uh, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's a great promise. It's called the Davidic covenant. It is God making this unconditional promise to David that not only will I give you a son who will build the house, but I will give you one who will reign forever and ever. Understand that whenever God changes your plans, He has a better plan for you. And that many times your plans get in the way of God's plan. That's why he has to say no to your plan. Here, God says, you want to build me a house? I'll build you a house. I'll give you Solomon and one more. I'll give you Messiah. I'll give you one who will reign forever and ever. Uh, Luke 131. You ever ever notice, you know, many times we hear the Christmas story and, and we we really just hear the words, but we don't understand the implication. That when, the, when Gabriel sw- spoke to Mary and he described the one who would be born, it is a fulfillment of this promise that God gave David over a thousand years before. It says in verse 31 of Luke 1, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him, now notice, the throne of his father, David. And then what does he say in verse 33? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. David, you want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house. And that house will last forever. The first part of the promise fulfilled in Solomon. The second part of the promise was fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you do when God changes your plans? What do you do when you feel disappointed? Understand that God has something better. Last year or this year when the Warriors won, Draymond Green was being interviewed and they they were asking about the painful 3-1 choke job last year. Remember? What happened? Yeah, we want to forget that. But this is what he said. That I had a letdown last year. But like I told everyone before, if Kevin Durant was the consolation prize to lose, thanks for that loss. And we champs this year. (laughs) He put it into perspective. The loss from the previous year was actually a blessing in disguise because they got Kevin Durant. Had they won, Kevin wouldn't have joined the team. And so he exchanged one lost year to maybe, hopefully, several championship years ahead. We champs this year. David, when he he heard 
that God says no to his plan. Instead of, instead of being sad, instead of being defiant, he had a positive attitude. And we'll see it in his prayer. We'll see it in his praises in the next point. We see not only the proposal of David, I want to build you a house. The promise of David, God says, no, I will build you a house. We see David praising God for three reasons. David's praises to God. Whenever you're disappointed, three things to praise God for. First of all, praise God for his generosity. Praise God for his blessings in your life. David says in verse 18, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? You could see David, maybe after he heard from Nathan the prophet, walking into the tent that housed the ark and just sitting before the Lord. And I'm sure David was disappointed, but he wasn't defiant. He wasn't demanding an answer. He simply sat. Perhaps he sat on the ground. We don't know, but he sat. And he says, who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Whenever you're disappointed with God, instead of focusing on what he has not given you, focus on what he has given you already. Focus on his blessings. You ever sit down and just say, Lord, who am I? Who, who, who am I that I should live this long? But no one's guaranteed this many years. Who am I that I should live this long? Who am I that, that I'm not homeless and, and I, live in, I have a place to live? Who am I, Lord, that, that I eat every day? Who am I that I should have this, this family? Who am I that I should drive this car? Who am I that I should have this ministry? Who am I? You ever think that way? You ever, you ever instead of being disappointed with what God hasn't given you, focus on what he has already given you? Who am I, Lord, that you take my house this far? And then what else does he say in verse 19? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord. You have spoken also, I like that word, focus on that word, also of your servant's house for a, for a great while to come. And this is the instruction of, for mankind, O Lord God. What's he saying? God, you've given me so much in the past, and on top of that, you've given me blessings upon blessings. You have also promised me a house. You ever think about not only God's past blessings in your life, but it's promised blessings on top of what you've already received. There's a verse in Romans 8.32 that I want you to jot down and, and perhaps even memorize. It says in Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not, here's the word, what? Also, with him, graciously give us all things. Paul was saying, we already have Jesus, and as said, I was singing, and that should be enough. But on top of that, what does he do? He also graciously gives us what? All things. In other words, anything that's good for you, God will not withhold. There are times that we, he would withhold blessings because he knows that it will hurt you. But he says, if I was, if I give you my best, if I'm, willing to give you Jesus Christ, if, it, if I did not spare him from the pain and the punishment of the cross so that you could be forgiven, how will I not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If I gave you the greater, will I not give you the lesser? In other words, it's what Paul is reminding us of. And so, David just sat. And he, he praised God for his generosity in his life. You, you have, who am I that, that you've taken me this far? And who am I that you will give to me in the future? He says, you, you have blessed me with blessings upon blessing. You have been so generous to me. And so here you find that whenever you're disappointed, praise God for his generosity. Secondly, whenever you're disappointed, praise God for his greatness. It says... In verse 20, I'm sorry, 
verse 22. Verse 22. Therefore, you are great, O Lord. Therefore, you are great, O Lord. So, Lord, who am I? I'm nothing. Lord, you are everything. Lord, you are great. How do we know that? Because of what he did for Israel in the past. He says, oh, Lord God, there is none like you. There is no God beside you. According to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people. Making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things. By driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt. A nation and its gods. David says, Lord, you've been generous. And Lord, you are great. And you've you've done great things for your people in the past. And you did something else, it says. And you established for yourself your people, Israel. Your people is to be your people forever. Notice that. Your people, Israel. And you, O Lord, became their God. They belong to you and you belong to them. You ever think about that? That when we focus on the greatness of God and understand that we belong to him, that's enough. And we're focused on, on so many other things instead of, instead of focusing on the fact that when you have Jesus in your life, you don't, need, you don't need crowns and castles and a career to be significant. That you have a great God and that's sufficient. That's enough. And that should be enough. But we, we don't see God in that way. We don't see the greatness of God. We don't see the majesty of God. We don't understand that we belong to God and God belongs to us. And that should be enough. Focus on the generosity of God. Focus on the greatness of God. And finally, focus on the the glory of God. Now, notice what it says in verse 25. Oh, now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken to your servant concerning your house. Do as you have spoken in verse 26, and your name will be magnified forever. David understood that life was not about him, that life was about magnifying and glorifying God. Do you remember even when he slew Goliath? What did he say? So that the people will know, so that the armies will know that there is a God who's over Israel, that there is a God who is alive. And so whenever David focuses on God, he understands that life is about glorifying God, that even in his victory as as a youth, even in his perhaps his greatest victory as a warrior in slaying Goliath, that what he was concerned about was the glory of God. And so he says, God, I want your name to be magnified. And then how does he do that? By asking God to fulfill his promise. Now, it's interesting. We never think of it this way, that whenever you ask God to fulfill his promise, it magnifies God. It glorifies God. Why is that? Because it shows that God's word is true. Notice what he says in verse 27. He says, For you, O Lord, you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servants, saying, I will build your house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Because I want your name to be glorified. So God, I'm asking you to fulfill your promise. That's the only reason I have courage to ask this. I mean, who would ask God for something so magnificent? But he says, Lord, because you promised, I'm going to ask for it. Notice in verse 28. He says, and now, O Lord, you are God and your words are true. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. God's plans are revealed in his promises. But his promises don't come into fruition. In other words, they don't take effect until you pray for it. And so David says, I want to pray for your promise so that your name is magnified, so that people will know that when you say something, that it's the truth. That when you promise something, it will come into fruition. That will happen, that it is as good as done. Um, give you an example. How many of you receive gift cards for for birthdays, Christmas, holidays? Yeah, 
Yeah, gift cards. How many of you, the moment you receive gift cards, you use it right away? Use it right away? Following day, you're at Starbucks, or even that same day, you're at Starbucks? Why? Because it's a gift card. Now, how many of you like to just put it in, put it in the drawer, or you forget about your gift cards? You ever do that? I know some people, they have stacks of gift cards that they haven't used because they just put in their drawers. Yeah, you have that? You, you've ever done that? You've ever forgotten about a gift card? Then all of a sudden you see it, oh man, does it still have some value in it? Because I don't know, it's been years. Because you just put it in a drawer. Now let me ask you this. If you put it in that drawer, is that gift card still yours? Yeah, it belongs to you because it's given to you. But have you benefited from it? No, because you haven't redeemed it. You need to see God's promises in the Bible as gift cards. It's yours. But you don't benefit until you pray. You don't benefit until you ask. No, uh, John John is here. He, he preached at the Wednesday prayer meeting. And one of the points is you have not because what? You ask not. You have not because you ask not. That's why prayer is so important. God gives you this promise. So I'm going to make all these promises to you. But in order for these promises to come true, you need to ask. You need to pray. That's why you need to understand and know what are God's promises in the Bible. That's why it's important to read your Bible. So you know what the gift cards are. So that you could redeem them. But why do you want to redeem them? So that God is glorified. So that people will know that when he says something, his words are true. In this passage, we see the proposal of David. He says, God, I want to build you a house. God says, you want to build me a house? Let me build you a house, David. And then we see the praises of David. When you're down, three things that you need to praise God for. Praise God for his generosity. Who am I? Praise God for his greatness. Lord, you are everything. And then praise God for his glory. Lord, I, I want to glorify you in my life, and I want to ask for your promises. Why? Because your promises are true. I will praise God when he says no, because his plan is better, and his promises are true. When God says no to you, praise him. Praise him. Why? Because he has something better. And that his promises to you are true. That when he says, all things work together for good to those who love me, you know that his promise, his statement is true. Um, Romans 8.28 is what I just quoted. Let's read it together. Because some of you, maybe you don't know this verse or you've forgotten about it, you haven't heard in a while. Let's read it together. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his promise. When God says no, praise him. Why? Because his plan is better and his promises are true. Maybe God didn't want you to become a doctor because if you had become a doctor, you would have been so busy that you wouldn't have had time to raise your family. Maybe God didn't want you to become a successful businessman because you wouldn't be able to handle all the success and your, your spiritual life would suffer. Understand that God is more concerned about your character than he is about your career. And so his plan is ultimately better. Or maybe, maybe it has to do with the love life. You know, I, I celebrated our, we celebrated our 26th anniversary last Thursday. And, uh, but looking back, you know, I, I realized God, the way God worked in my life, because uh, my wife, Corinne, my beautiful wife, she, she was not the first person I was engaged to. Ooh, it got quiet all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> 30 years ago, I was actually engaged to someone else. And I was supposed to get married uh, right after I graduated from, from seminary. On the night of my graduation, I, I received two things. I received my diploma and I received back the engagement, the engagement ring. And I didn't, know, well, I didn't know what God was doing for a couple of years. But looking back, I understand that God's plan is better. When God says no to you, praise him. 
Praise him because he knows what he's doing. His plan is infinitely better in your life. And his promises are true. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, maybe you've come today and and you realize that, you know what? I'm not here by accident. I'm here because of God's grace and he wanted me here to, to hear this message. I want you to understand that God's plan for you, his ultimate plan, what he wants to do is to save you. That's why he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. And so if today you've come and you don't know where you're going, if you were to die today, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if that's the desire of your heart, just quietly where you're at, just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. I hear and now open the door of my heart. I receive you into my life as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father, that you would help them to grow in their spiritual life. Maybe you're a believer, but maybe you have some resentments, you have some bitterness against God because the things that you plan, the things that you want to do are, are not happening. I want you to know that God loves you. He wants to bless you. But he can't bless you if your plans get in the way. He can't fill your arms with good things if you have junk in them. And so maybe God just asking you just to throw away the junk, just to say, Lord, not my will, but your will in my life. Lord, I know that your plans are better. I may not understand them now, Lord, but I know that ultimately your plan for my life is the best. That if you gave your son for me, how will you not along with him graciously give me all things? So maybe it's just a, a prayer of, of affirmation to God, a prayer of praise, a prayer prayer of confession, whatever it is that God has spoken to you about, just do, uh, would you just do business with him right now? Father, I thank you for ministering to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have our highest good in your mind at all times. And we know that, Lord, because of the cross. And so we pray that as we celebrate, as we partake of communion today, that it would be a powerful reminder that you are a good God, that you are a great God. And that, Father, you work all things for the good of those who love you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll partake of communion together. It's